good afternoon everybody uh, so uh, yesterday uh, the infosys prize was given out and today we have the honor of hosting uh, professor sunita saraogi who won the award for her contributions to computer science i would all uh, ask you to join me in applauding her So uh, over the years, she has made many contributions, and Infosys Prize is just one of the recognitions. Uh, so today she'll be here giving a lecture, uh, uh, which is also called Infosys Prize Lecture. And our department this year is celebrating 50 years, so this would be part of the CSA 50-year Golden Jubilee talk. Uh, now to introduce her and her contributions, I would welcome Professor Jayanth Haritsa, also an Infosys awardee. Please applaud his contributions as well. Uh, to introduce the speaker. Uh, so good afternoon. As Chiru already mentioned, we are absolutely delighted to have as our distinguished speaker for this three-in-one lecture, which is the Infosys lecture, also the Golden Jubilee lecture, and the plenary lecture for the uh, FAT workshop that uh, Chiru is organizing, Professor Sunita Sarawagi from IIT Bombay. So Sunita showed her intellectual abilities very early in her academic career. She received the 16th rank in the JE exam of 1987. Yeah. And then went uh, to IIT Kharagpur, where she worked on geometric algorithms with Professor Partha Pratim Chakravarti, who, as many of you would know, is one of the leading computer scientists in the country, and until recently was also the director of IIT Kharagpur. So she graduated close to the top of her class, receiving the silver medal for stochastic, uh, for scholastic, <laughs> not stochastic, but scholastic <laughs> excellence. <laughs> and then uh, moved to the University of California at Berkeley, where she worked on the then emerging fields of data warehousing and tape resident databases. This work was done with Professor Michael Stonebreaker, who as you know is a legend in the database community and also the Turing awardee in 2014. So subsequently after graduating with her PhD from Berkeley, she joined the data mining group at the, at the IBM's Almaden Research Center and there she worked with some of the leading lights in the field, like Dr. Rakesh Agarwal, who is very well known to our ISC campus because he has been here several times as a visiting chair and has given several talks here. Then in early 99, she moved back to India and joined the faculty of IIT Bombay. At that time, it was called the Kanwal Rekhi School of Information Technology, which has now morphed into the computer science department. So from the, uh, uh, since that time, she has been with IIT Bombay. So during this intervening three decades, uh, Sunita has made exceptional contributions and extremely creative and in innovative results. And these have been recognized with many accolades, including best paper awards in the top database and data mining conferences. And uh, also, she is a fellow of the Indian National Academy of Engineering. Then just last year, she got the Distinguished Alumnus Award of IIT Kharagpur. And as Chiru mentioned, just yesterday from Professor Amartya Sen, she received the Infosys Award. So she has, apart from her own technical contributions, Sunita has also played a leading role in uh, uh, essentially guiding the community. And this spreads across databases, data mining, information retrieval, statistics, and machine learning. She was part of the board of, uh, and, uh, the endowment board of both VLDB as well as SIGKDD. So as you can see, her uh, 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 footprint is over a very large span of activities and fields. So uh, if I might be permitted to inject a personal note, I have always viewed Sunita as a researcher's researcher. That is, whenever you read any of her papers, you wish you had done it yourself. So that is the caliber that she brings in. Very elegant mathematical formulations for eminently practical problems. So with that uh, brief introduction, I'll request Sunita to walk us through the life cycle of machine learning models. Sunita. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, Jayant and Chiranjeev. I'm really honored to be giving this talk, and uh, I hope uh, you get something out of the one hour you spend in this talk. Um, so uh, machine learning, even 10 years back, was a subfield of computer science. And maybe there were a few thousand researchers all over the world, and maybe a few companies, particularly in finance and uh, 
like retail who would use some machine learning models but in the last 10 years magic has happened and machine learning has grown not to be the most prominent field not just in computer science but it's shadowing even the other sciences and it's touching many aspects of our day to day life so in this question in this talk i want to ask is the lab mouse sorry the lab field ready to face the real world okay so 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 that's what i would like to take you through so uh, i was told that uh, i should address a general audience so i just uh, want to sorry okay I'll, it's okay i'll just uh, yes. ah yeah this is good you know even if so i'll just uh, you know work with this so um, so just uh, in the interest of addressing a general audience let me just start with a core model in machine learning which is a classification model so the input is uh, typically denoted with x and x can be just about anything an image a piece of text a clip of audio and uh, the goal of the model is to produce a y which is just a modest scalar variable which can take values say one from a one of a finite set of values and uh, in machine learning you believe that learning this mapping from x to y through a deterministic program is hard so you use lots of examples of correct input output pairs which i am denoting as x comma y to train a model and once you have trained such a model which has this very simple uh, specification you can solve lot of different tasks for example if your input x is an image then suddenly you can give a computer a power to the, the power to see and that has applications in surveillance so like in iit bombay we would like to tell apart panthers from dogs using uh, the capacity of classification of uh, trained on a image uh, input and it has applications in medical diagnostics when the input is a text you give the computer the power to read and to understand natural language so for example we have a project a complaint a project called venter where we try to route uh, consumer complaints like citizen complaints using a text classifier and there are lots of other applications thousands of applications in forecasting recommendations advertisement in the sciences in education the list keeps going now in spite of this very varied set of scenarios in which the model the core classification model is being deployed the core algorithm for creating such models is disarmingly simple so you are given uh, your training data set d let's say you can uh, we are going to denote the training data set as d and that you can think of as samples drawn from an unknown distribution so let's say we call it pxy this is this unknown distribution you don't get to see the distribution but you see the samples and you have to choose as a creator of the machine learning model a functional form a function which takes as input an x and has parameters which we are going to denote as theta throughout the talk so as to give you a probability distribution over the output label y given the x so in machine learning we believe that the label always has some stochasticity attached to it so we model that output not as a single scalar output but as a distribution so your goal is to you know sort of create this function f which will take as input x and which has parameters theta and which will spew out a distribution over the possible y's and uh, <coughs> so during training so during the creation of the model uh, we try to learn the thetas and an age old principle which has served machine learning researchers well for a long time is this maximum likelihood estimation principle which i am going to denote mle throughout the talk and there it's very simple to state principle i want to find the theta corresponding to which the likelihood or the probability of seeing this current sample is maximized this is just straight lifted from a statistics textbook okay that's the simple mle principle and this principle with a appropriately carefully designed function f 
gives us two advantages. First, we can cast the training problem as a continuous optimization problem and it can be solved with scalable algorithms like gradient descent. And second, with some amount of care to make sure that we do not overfit, we can provide guarantees that if you have a new X star which is sampled from this unknown distribution from which the training data was generated, then this function f x star theta is going to give you a distribution over y which is faithful assuming that your sample size is large enough. Okay? So this is the textbook uh, algorithm for training machine learning models and more or less this is the recipe that we have been following for 30 years or more. And now I'm just going to quickly take you through the different forms of F or function classes which have been explored over the years. So, uh, you know, the field of machine learning is at least 70 years old and uh, many different function forms of uh, F have for F have been explored. You know, we have gone through perceptrons, logistic regression classifiers, neural networks, naive base, LDA, support vector machines, gradient boosting random forest. There are like 30 different machine learning models which have been developed. Each of these have gone through their own boom and burst cycle. Uh, but one uh, core model which has kind of survived through these ages is this very simple framework where you take as input an x and you have some human intervened method of converting this x which could be an image or an audio clip or a text into a fixed dimensional vector. Okay? So you take as input an arbitrary object and you convert it into a d dimensional vector and then your model just comes up with weights to on each of these d dimensions which you can also think of as features and uh, <coughs> you finally get a real valued score which correlates with the discrete class label and with some nonlinear function after that you get a discrete prediction. So this is behind uh, you know the basic framework fits for perceptrons, logistic regression, SVMs, LDAs, you know you can sort of think of all these different major classes of classifiers as fitting this framework. And this is the era in which we lived up until like say 2000 and we were very happy with the fact that the training objective for such classifiers was convex and you therefore had reliable training, you had uh, scalable, you had scalable training and the outcomes were more or, more or less predictable because you did a lot of work in the feature engineering here and uh, there were lots of applications in closed settings like say a bank or a retail shop or a particular advertising agency. They would each have their training data, create their model in their enter in within the walls of their enterprise and use it again within the same walls. Neural networks had been around all this while. Okay? So uh, neural networks just take this linear function and expand it out both horizontally and vertically. So you take this linear template of input features, weighted sum of input features followed by some nonlinear activations and you stack them horizontally and vertically so that you have the capability to approximate any function and you are not making any modeling biases and therefore you have high capacity and uh, neural networks for a long time like up, up until 2010 used to sometimes work, sometimes not work. We used to know that on the digit recognition data set you can get very good accuracy with neural networks but I would not advise that you try neural networks because you may not be able to train it and most of the time the nonlinear function which was used in between two layers was this sigmoid function which is a continuous differentiable function but that changed in 2011 and uh, thereafter. So bunch of uh, dedicated deep learning researchers figured out uh, engineering of this neural network and uh, there was contributions from the mathematical optimization people, there were variants of stochastic gradient descent algorithms uh, developed 
and then uh, in parallel the hardware companies were donating huge amounts of computing power there was a lot of data being generated and for many difficult tasks we started getting record breaking accuracy and that brought us to the age of the mega models okay and uh, many challenging tasks which previously people were solving within their own uh, walls and within their own silos particularly for tasks like speech recognition translation uh, image understanding you know each of these were separate subfields of computer science and these communities spent a lot of time in engineering features and developing you know pipelines of methods to achieve a particular task but all of these tasks started giving record breaking accuracy because now you had the power to train a high capacity network which could have a lot of parameters like billions of parameters and uh, because of hardware advances you could train them on huge amounts of data and of course you used a lot of energy now because of these three requirements such training consequently could only be done by a few resource rich organizations and then it was supposed to be used by lot more people and outside the walls of organizations where such models were being created and that threw up a lot of challenges and this is what i meant in my talk of how does a machine learning model serve the real world so after you have done the training now is the then you enter the phase of serving which is means which where, where you basically use a trained model you deploy a trained model to get predictions and unlike in the earlier setting like say when earlier a bank was using a machine learning model they were training and deploying within the same organization now we have some resource rich organizations with lot of access training these mega models and they are going to be deployed in many varied settings essentially you are throwing the model into the real world and anyone can download and use it and when you think of the different serving scenarios you find that only in a very small fraction of the cases you have this ideal scenario where the training distribution matches the test distribution but there are a lot of other usage scenarios where that assumption is broken and you can think of this slide as also the outline of my talk i am going to discuss this different serving scenarios so we are already comfortable in this space but now i am going to talk about what does it mean to use a machine learning model which has been trained by a large organization in a niche domain by a small application which does not care about good performance in the entire distribution but only in a subset of the distribution another challenging real world situation is the model is deployed on an example which might be just arbitrarily far away from the original distribution and then you might have heard in press many embarrassing failure stories of machine learning models confidently giving wrong output for examples which just have no place no reason to be used on that model okay so so that is uh, the part we will talk about uh, after this and then finally we'll talk about uh, the the other situation where there are people who are Uh, who are uh, specifically trying to break a model and then they introduce a new kind of out of distribution sample and uh, how does current machine learning models address this three kind of adversarial situations so first let's just kind of hear some glorious stories of the case when you are in the ideal scenario where the training and test distributions match so some of you might have seen this uh, nice graphs like say in the this uh, there is a well known uh, data set which is this image net data set where you have a large number of images and you have to identify objects in that image this is a, a kind of a data set on which competitions are held every year and um, you know so this is like the, the trace of uh, the outcomes of the uh, 
of this competition across different years. And on this axis, you see error. And every year, error is uh, reducing. But at some point around 2012, when deep learning methods started being used, the error went down steadily until at this point, where you see this red line, the error became less than human error. Okay. So that's when people went into the hyperbole that you can have now AI give superhuman performance. So similar stories repeat, say for another challenging task, uh, speech recognition. So in speech recognition, there is another well-known data set, which is this switchboard data set. And uh, so here you train a model on a subset of the switchboard data set and you test it on another subset of the same data set. So perfect training test distribution match. And again, along here, you have error rate dropping. And this red dotted line here is the human level uh, error. And the, you know, around this time, the error became less than the human level error. Um, this is another task. It's uh, not a mainstream task. I mentioned it because in our lab, we are working in this problem of doing grammar error correction using again a deep learning. So in grammar error correction, you take an incorrect sentence and you correct its grammatical error. And even here we have shown that, you know, you can get human level performance. But we are in this talk interested in the settings where you are not in this ideal situation where you are deploying the model on instances which come from the same distribution as the training distribution. But rather, we have a, a situation where you want, sorry, you, you want to apply a model on a niche domain, which is a subset of the training domain. So here are some examples. So suppose you have a speech recognition model which has been trained over the entire world's data or maybe mostly North American centric model and you want to adapt it to accents of a particular region. Uh, you might have a translation model which are typically trained on news data and you want to apply it to do translation of medical transcripts. Or you might have a language model which has been trained on mainstream data, like say Wikipedia data, and you want to apply it to solve NLP tasks in physics or in another narrow domain, like say gaming domain or Unix domain. So, uh, so these are this is what I mean by uh, wanting to use a model to serve a domain which is narrow and a subset of the training domain. Okay. And uh, so, so now let's just define what uh, I mean by this uh, domain adaptation problem. So you are given a trained model theta, uh, and this model has been trained on a large data subset T, and you are given a small amount of label data L in a target domain, and I'm just going to denote that as Q. Uh, but L is not very large. If L was very large, then this would not be an interesting problem. So L is not large enough to train a good model on its own right. Uh, but we believe that this training data is kind of universal. So there exists a training domain, which is a subset you know, we, the, so there exists from the training domain, there exists some DJ, which sort of follows the target distribution Q, uh, but we have not identified that explicitly. And our goal is to get the best of theta, which is this global model, and the small amount of label data L to make the theta adapt to the Q distribution. So now uh, you might wonder, you know, if you are training a model with billions of parameters, why can't the model remember everything? Why, you know, because it, it has seen the some examples from the Q distribution also. So why do we need to even domain adapt? You know, if I have trained a model, speech recognition model with both Indian accents and American accents and, uh, you know, Scottish accents. And now if I deploy it on the Indian accent, it should work on the Indian accent because you have, it's not like you have tried to uh, bottleneck the number of parameters. But unfortunately, that does not happen. And uh, uh, we have seen that uh, even when the number of parameters is very large, uh, if the samples 
which uh, are matching your target domain Q are a small part of D, then the trained theta can be grossly suboptimal. Now, I am going to demonstrate this phenomenon with a particular study that we did for uh, word embeddings. So, in uh, natural language, the, for natural language tasks, uh, one key component in any deep learning pipeline is to uh, convert each discrete word into a real vector in some semantic space which captures its meaning. So that is called the word embedding. And typically these word embeddings can be learned using just plain text. So suppose you can just feed to this algorithm which learns the word embeddings the whole of Wikipedia and it will assign to each word a vector which denotes sort of roughly the semantics of that word. So, uh, so now suppose if you have trained a word embedding model on the whole of Wikipedia which is has a union of several topics and you are interested in a particular subdomain say physics and you expect that all words uh, to capture you know the different senses in which a particular word can be used. So, uh, but that unfortunately was not the case. So, I will illustrate with an example, consider a word like potential. Potential has multiple senses. So, there is a general sense of potential which captures possibility, uh, capability and impact and that is let us call this the global sense. But if you think of the word potential in uh, you know the pro prominent sense of the word potential in a physics corpus, then it should be kind of close to words like voltage, kinetic and energy. So what we did is we took this global model which was trained on the in on entire Wikipedia and we looked for the 10 or 20 nearest neighbors of word potential and we found that none of them included the physics specific terms. It means that the niche sense of potential of the physics corpus was totally steamrolled by the predominant usage of the word potential and hence the need for uh, domain adaptation. Now some of you who are in the NLP field might question would you could you use context sensitive embeddings. So you do not just assign an absolute embedding for word but look at the embedding of the word in the context of the sentence in which it lies and would that handle the multisense problem. Actually it does not you know because typically sentences are short and even context sensitive embeddings do not capture the physics term sense of the term. And uh, so, uh, so in this paper which uh, we wrote in ACL 2019, we showed that this is a big problem. And now, uh, you know, you have to do, do domain adaptation. So domain adaptation is a, is a well-known problem. And uh, for a long time, uh, a, a kind of a standard recipe for domain adaptation is what machine learning researchers call fine tuning. So in fine tuning, you initialize, you train a model uh, which you initialize with the global model theta and then you run some more steps of gradient descent training. Uh, this is what we call as running MLE on the limited training data L and you regularize the parameters so that you stay close to the global model and you just implement this by kind of running the training iterations by initializing with the global models uh, but only on the domain specific data and you have to be very careful about how many iterations you use on L. If you, um, if you, uh, if you, sorry, so actually, uh, so, so, so if you, if you, if you run too many iterations, then you will forget the learnings from the global model and if you do too few iterations, then you would not adapt enough. So there are, uh, for example, terms like nucleon which have the same sense in both the global corpus and in the domain specific corpus. So if you are aggressive in training on the domain specific data, you would forget perhaps even this sense. If in the limited labeled data, there are not enough documents which contain the term nucleon. Okay. So uh, basically uh, what uh, we 
found that fine tuning the global parameters with small amount of physics data was no better than training a model from scratch on the physics data alone, even though the physics data was small. So then we tried lots of different ways of improving the fine tuning, um, you know, playing with uh, how we regularize the thetas and when, uh, you know, lots of how we schedule the training and all that, but none of it worked. And finally, we just gave up and said, for text documents, since Wikipedia is a public corpus, let's go ahead and use standard IR methods to use a text index to find the documents in your training data original Wikipedia corpus, which is similar to the small number of physics documents that you have in hand. Okay. We don't know how to solve this in general for arbitrary instances, but for text documents, we know how to go after the subset of the training data that is re relevant to your current domain. And now you retrain your model on the union of these two uh, documents. And that does surprisingly better. You know, so suppose uh, in this graph, we are showing on the x axis training epochs and the y axis something which correlates with accuracy and the green line is where we revisited the source corpus and all these different other lines are the ones where we tried aggressively different methods of fine tuning. None of those work compared to just revisiting the corpus. So uh, you know uh, actually if you think uh, from uh, a mathematical viewpoint there is nothing great about it but I just wanted to challenge the standard practice of domain adapting by just fine tuning a model that you just download from the web. I think that can be uh, quite suboptimal. You are short changing yourself and you should look for alternative solutions. Okay. So the key message from this work is that knowledge about non-dominant senses of words can be obliter obliterated in a global model uh, and that cannot be recovered by a few steps of fine tuning. And sometimes you have no option but to revisit the source data. Okay. But of course, uh, revisiting source data uh, is not always practical. Uh, and uh, we just dismissed that fine tuning is not going to work. And even if you had, uh, you know, decent amount of uh, so fine tuning is not going to work. We saw that it didn't work for word embeddings. Actually, I have experience with another application in which we tried to use fine tuning and that was for personalization. So there was this mega conversation agent which was being trained and uh, we wanted to personalize the conversation agent for each user using the conversations in which that particular user was specifically engaged and we found that that's also a domain adaptation problem, by the way. And we found that while such fine tuning or adaptation helped for some users, there was a heavy tail of users for which it did not help. So when we, so there are many different variants of domain adaptation problem. And in this situation, we are interested in the case where the number of domains is very large. It's not like we have one domain to which we want to target, but we might have millions of domains. Like again in the conversation example, if each user is a domain, you would like to adapt to each of these million domains efficiently and well. Okay. So uh, in such situations, the question was, could we somehow use uh, domain demarcated training data to learn the process of adaptation. So, uh, so, there ha so this is also a kind of hot field in machine learning. So learning to adapt, uh, there are many approaches uh, which have been proposed. There is a method called MAML, uh, and, but in our experience we found that to be too unstable. There, is, uh, there are methods like SNAIL, but those require self-attention over the domain data and therefore it's they are kind of slow they kind of quadratically depend on the amount of training data that you have and then there are this class of methods which is only possible in deep learning where people try to use in domain data to generate the parameters of each domain okay so for veterans of machine learning this is very shocking and it's just not clear how you can train you can train a meta neural network 
which will take as inputs incoming you know online stream of domain specific data and generate the parameters of that domain which will then be used as a classifier for your uh, domain. So there is a paper um, in, in Europe's uh, 2018 which is deep state which tries to follow that approach. So none of these approaches actually worked very well for us and uh, what instead uh, we are proposing is a method of domain adaptation uh, which actually unfortunately we are able to only make it work for regression tasks where the output y is a continuous variable and not a discrete variable. And uh, the, there, is, there are two main ideas in that method. So first what we uh, do during, train, during the training process is to take your global parameters theta and partition them so that there is a shared component across all domains and then each domain has its own domain specific parameters. But the set of domain specific parameters is open ended because you might also see new domains at the time of testing. And remember we are trying to learn the meta learning uh, model which means we want to learn to adapt. And uh, so, uh, so, the, so what we want to do is carefully choose the domain specific parameters so that you can train the domain specific parameters without gradient descent which is iterative and through which gradients cannot flow to the shared model which is the you know the outer model the meta model. And uh, also we wanted this procedure to be online. And actually that we were able to successfully do you on for regression tasks. So, uh, so here is the main idea of that model. So we call this uh, online adaptation for regression and we have you know, we think of it as an extension of LSTMs and we therefore call it ARU for adaptive regression unit. So the network uh, works as follows you take as input an x and then you have this shared parameters which are the bottom of the network and only at the last layer you introduce domain specific parameters. Now again this might look like obvious thing in speech recognition people have been doing personalization like this for a long time. So where is the aha okay. So the main point here is that because this y is continuous you can cast it as a regression problem. And if your regression loss is least square, then you can find the solutions for the domain specific parameters in closed form. You remember the solutions for the linear regression uh, you know, loss? Because it is closed form, you can calculate the domain specific parameters again by just maintaining a bunch of sufficient statistics. You just have to maintain the covariance matrix and the matrix of x to y correlations and you are able to get the parameters the domain specific parameters in closed form using this matrix inversion uh, formula. So for people you know not supposed to get into the math of it but the summary is that you can solve for this domain specific uh, parameters in closed form without using iterative gradient descent and now you can embed this domain specific parameters in some more layers of deep network maybe you want to get the best of domain specific predictions and global predictions. So we have uh, some more layers on top like these are the some more layers of shared parameters and uh, with that you have a network where you kind of embed the domain specific uh, module in a way that it can be trained along with the global model without requiring nested iterations for domain specific parameters. And that gave us really uh, much uh, you know amazing accuracies we got uh, you know we did much better than existing domain adaptation models for various tasks these are all time series forecasting tasks where we had retail sales data and we had to predict the demand for the next eight weeks. And in all of them we found that this online adaptation really helped us get the best balance of global and uh, local models. And also running time wise we did much better than existing models. Okay. Yes. 
Uh, 0.136. Actually, we did a significance test, although I don't have the numbers here. Okay, so here maybe this uh, particular data set is not that large. Okay, but if you look at the Walmart data, we did uh, quite well. So the key message from this part is that domain specific parameters that can be learned in closed form leads to better training dynamics and faster online adaptation than existing meta learning methods which either introduce nested uh, gradient descent loops or which require self attention or which depend on the magic of deep networks to generate domain specific parameters. Oops, oh sorry, I didn't mean to end the talk, okay here. Yeah. Okay. Now we go to the uh, to the third part. Okay. So here, let's now uh, look at the the third serving challenge, which is when a model which has been put in the open is deployed on instances which are outside the training distribution, and unlike in the domain adaptation phase where the end application is aware that they are trying to you know go outside the domain or they are interested in a specialized domain. So therefore there is some adaptation distinct offline adaptation phase and there is a little bit of label data to help you adapt here there is no such uh, preparation. So you just face an instance and that instance might be outside your domain. Uh, and uh, a big problem is that very often uh, unless you plan specifically for it, such out of distribution instances can be provided a prediction with very high confidence. So here is a very toy situation to illustrate how that can happen. Consider a, a, a classification problem, a two way classification problem, you would like to separate the red points from so the red points from the blue points in this two dimensional space. And uh, let us say this black star is a test point. Now, uh, if I ask you what label should you assign to this red point, okay, uh, what would you say? You do not know, right? Because you are all smart. I mean, this is IASC. You are saying you do not know because you know, you have full knowledge, right? But not so with current models, okay? A current uh, model would happily assign to that uh, star a red prediction with very, very high confidence because you try to create a separate separator between the red and blue points and you will find that, hey, this should be on the red side. Whereas you might have gotchas like this where there might be a cluster of blue points which just happen to be not present in your training distribution and the right thing for you in such cases should have been to say, I do not know. Okay. So, uh, so in order to say, I do not know, you have to be able to model the distribution of the input px. Okay? Now that can be very challenging because in general x is very high dimensional. One of the reason classification models work is because we are only interested in creating the conditional distribution of a scalar variable y given x always is present. Okay? x is always, so that is a sig significantly easier uh, distribution learning task than learning the distribution of x. So uh, many, so this is actually a, uh, a problem uh, that many researchers are currently working on and uh, one trick that people use is uh, to create the px distribution not at the raw level but to depend on your existing neural network and maybe model the distribution of the hidden vectors not the raw input and uh, I think that sort of would work. Uh, another some set of researchers feel that this is a calibration issue. So the model in such cases uh, should just output a flat distribution over all labels. Okay? And uh, so, so there are uh, many takes on this. So uh, on the calibration side, we have uh, a paper uh, which uh, in, in ICML 2018 where we tried to use some kernel methods for calibration. But I think of uh, that uh, 
you know, just depending purely on calibration to detect OOD instances may not work. And some of these other papers, uh, you know, say so this paper which appeared in ICLR 2020 might be a better bet if you want to detect OOD instances. So in this talk, I'm not going to dwell too much on how you would detect out of distribution instances. But uh, I want to go to the next question of can we do better than just reject out of distribution examples? So can we somehow learn some systematic pattern of appearance of out of distribution instances, given that we have such a huge amount of training data? And if you have data set which is so large, very often that data set would capture many different experiences and a user might be able to tell you that the set of experiences which are captured in the data set is a subset of the set of experiences which might appear in, you know, in future. So can you use that knowledge to train a model to handle out of distribution instances better than just rejecting them? So we call this uh, the problem of domain generalization. So, so here our assumption is that the training data is a union of k domains. But we are told that during deployment, during service, serving, we might encounter new domains. Okay. So as an example, suppose if I am training an OCR model and in my training data I see documents which span 20 fonts. I know that new fonts, new variants might be present which I have not seen in the training data. So I would like to use the knowledge that font is a domain to handle, to plan to handle new domains better. Okay. Likewise, if you have trained a speech recognition system with 100 subjects, you know that this is only a subset and you will be seeing new subjects. Does the domain boundary of each individual speaker help you capture variations that arise out of speaker change so that you can handle new speaker samples during test time? That is the question we are hoping to answer. So uh, this is again a problem which can be solved uh, through many different ways. Sometimes you might be lucky and you might be able to somehow wipe out, identify domain specific signals and wipe them out. So, uh, so in uh, current deep learning, one idea which is used uh, for wiping out domain specific signals is called domain adversarial networks. So these networks are like the GANs in the sense that you first train one network to tell apart different domains and then you train the main classifier network so that that network cannot pick, pick out the domain from the last layer of the classifier. But what we found is that this idea, although it makes a lot of sense, if you can wipe out domain specific signals, then of course you can handle new domains. But the, the challenge is that there are many problems where it's much easier to identify the label while hanging on to the domain signals than to wipe out the domain signals. So like different fonts might be uh, so different, you know, fonts like Times Roman font might be so different from a calligraphic font that you are much better off training your label classifier to, to kind of separately do special case feature engineering or feature extraction for Times Roman font and uh, calligraphic font rather than demand that all letters be first transformed into a neutral, font neutral representation and then I am going to classify the characters in that image, okay. okay. So, uh, so that is uh, what uh, we are, uh, we are, we, we, we felt and that, uh, you know, that actually led us to introduce a new thought into how people handle uh, domain generalization and that thought is data augmentation. So we are not going to wipe out domain signals, but rather we are going to augment our training data with new samples which we think come out of hallucinated domains. So we are going to imagine new domains because we have seen 100 domains at the time of training. We are going to learn uh, continuous representation using this 100 domains and 
then using this continuous space of domain features, we are going to generate new training examples around the existing training examples and train our label classifier to, to correctly classify these hallucinated examples. And that can be handled through this algorithm which we call this cross gradient uh, training algorithm. So, in, in that algorithm we first use a domain classifier. So, you have this input x, we use a domain classifier to extract latent continuous features of domain and we then use uh, you know backprop to augment the training data with examples which are perturbed along directions of domain change. Okay. Likewise, we train the, lab, the domain classifier to be insensitive to label change, hence the name cross gradient algorithm. And uh, I will skip this uh, training algorithm and we show that uh, with this uh, cross gradient training algorithm, we get modest gains over uh, you know the domain adversarial network that I was talking about. And also we do better than existing adversarial training examples which we call here label grad. Okay? But this is very much work in progress and we are still working on new methods of uh, domain generalization which can handle also a very large number of domains and which might even work even when you do not have domain supervision available in your training data. So, the key message from this part uh, is that uh, out of domain de detection should be an integral part of any learn uh, of any machine learn model to avoid embarrassing high confidence predictions. And uh, in some cases you can teach classifiers to be robust to out of distribution instances. Uh, particularly those instances which arise out of domain change using uh, multi domain training data. And uh, third, uh, you know, actually I want to stress this because many people in machine learning who work in domain adaptation, they quickly try to wipe domains and I think we, we sort of try to push this idea that wiping domain is not possible and it is sometimes much harder than augmenting training data with new or hallucinated domains. Okay, okay. so uh, how much time more do I have? Oh, okay. Great. Okay. So, uh, so I'll just uh, end with uh, this uh, last point of um, the last challenge of serving, which is when a model is faced with examples which are adversarial. Some of you might have seen this uh, example of uh, how a trained image classification model is uh, easily fooled by adversarial generated images. So, suppose if you have an image classifier, you give it as input this image and it predicts correctly the label panda with say 57.7 percent confidence. What the bad adversarial guys try to do is add to this image this white noise. It just looks like some harmless white kind of noise and produce a new image which will fool your image classifier. So, uh, you know you add this uh, white noise to this, uh, it is actually not white noise, it is very you know craftily generated. You add to what currently looks like white noise to this image and you get another image. To us it still looks like a panda, but to a machine it is uh, easy to make it change its prediction. So, this is what is called an adversarial attack and there are many people have worked on this area. I have personally not worked on this and uh, people have shown that many models for face recognition, for uh, you know detecting stop signs, for uh, you know uh, identifying voice commands, uh, audio commands, they are all susceptible to such adversarial attacks. In fact, one of the active researchers in this area, these are the people like Madri and all, they, I like this line in their one of their papers which says that even in settings where machine learning achieves superhuman accuracy, an adversary can often introduce perturbations that reduce their accuracy to levels of random guessing. Okay? So, it, it can be quite bad. Okay? So, um, so, uh, uh, so, the main idea uh, behind this, uh, uh, behind models which try to uh, brace themselves 
for handling adversarial examples uh, is uh, what they call adversarial training. And they go on uh, this premise that the key reasons for failure of the so-called brittle ML models is because they are trained for expected case performance instead of worst case performance. So their fix is to train the model so that they are robust to uh, these worst case inputs. So what do you call as a worst case input? So a worst case input is where the input has been perturbed by a noise which gives rise to a new input which to humans look the same but which causes a machines to change its prediction. So, uh, so their solution is to train for such worst case input. So normally when you do normal MLE training which also has a counterpart in the minimization problem where instead of the MLE loss, MLE objective you minimize error or loss. So normal training you train the parameters to minimize the sum over loss over all training instances whereas in adversarial training you train the parameters so as to minimize the loss not over just the original x but x which has been perturbed by a, by a noise vector delta and delta is not allowed to be very large because then the change would be perceptible to humans and then the problem itself would become undefined. Okay? So they have uh, you know, this bound on the size of the change and so now you train the model to be good in the worst case. Okay? But uh, you know this, this is what uh, is known and there are lots of algorithms uh, in this area uh, and uh, now this topic is really hot in ML. So I am not going to be able to give you a key message. I have myself not worked on this area but currently I have ongoing work on creating robust models for NLP tasks where you supervise the robustness rather than assume adversarial robustness. And um, in terms of uh, my summary of the state of uh, the current work is that for image and perhaps even for uh, other continuous input data, adversarial training actually drops accuracy. Uh, this paper by again one of the top researchers in this field uh, establishes that. But for NLP tasks, adversarial perturbations, for example, those obtained by perturbing the word embeddings actually leads to improvement in accuracy. Uh, so this is a recent, you know, hot off the press paper which establishes that. And uh, now I think the field is still open for research in this area. So for grad students in the room who are looking for research problems, uh, it's, an, it's a hot area but on the other hand you have to work really, really fast because lots of other people around the world are trying to solve the same problem. Uh, so actually now I, I'm coming to the end of my talk. So uh, let me first uh, summarize. I would, uh, so what I tried to say in this talk is that training machine learning models is uh, a very resource intensive process um, and that has led to this uh, modality of uh, a model being trained by one organization and being used by several others often outside the organizational boundaries. And uh, the MLE training objective only ensures generalization when the training and test distribution matches. But there are several settings of serving in the life cycle of a model where this assumption is broken. We went through three such settings. So first, when a model is required to serve in a specific narrow domain and uh, that gives rise to this uh, sub area of domain adaptation on which there is a lot of work. Uh, but what I wanted to push uh, this idea, I wanted to push in this talk is that uh, the existing practice for domain adaptation is fine tuning and in this talk I tried to kind of uh, say don't do fine tuning, rather revisit this problem, uh, you know, revisit the source if you can. Otherwise, plan for domain adaptation if you have multi-domain training data and maybe for the regression problem how we were able to create, you know, very um, sort of convenient plug-in of domain specific parameters in a global network could perhaps be extended for other non-regression tasks as well. 
Uh, for the case of unknown distributions, we do not have a dis where we do not have a distinct adaptation phase with label data. Uh, detecting ODs, it's a challenging problem. So that is one thing you could do, you know, you could first detect the out of distribution exam examples or reject and reject them, or you could do domain generalization. And uh, we just went over ideas for how to do domain generalization. Then we talked about adversarial instances and there the recipe is to train robust models by using adversarial uh, training methods which try to minimize worst case performance uh, perturbations of the training instances. But this is now a kind of a very active field, a lot of work is still happening in this area. Um, so now I'll just conclude my talk with some uh, sort of thoughts for future work. Uh, so one, uh, so when you go through these, uh, you know, three different uh, serving settings and the solutions for them, to me, they look like just bandages, you know, they are like reactive post fixes uh, arising out of a, a wrong starting premise. You know, just 10 years back, machine learning was operating in this lab setting where it was okay to assume that the training and test distributions matched. Now, if, if at that time we knew that models are going to be used in the wild, perhaps we would not have even started with this MLE kind of training. Uh, but I don't know what you could do if not MLE. You know, maybe the robust training, ro domain generalization, these are small mm, diversions from the core MLE training, but perhaps there is a totally different way to think about this problem. Another culprit could be the monolithic structure of the model. Perhaps if we had a more, more modular uh, design of the network, uh, where we could clearly specify which set of parameters are domain specific. And like the way you do object oriented programming, where you declare interfaces and then each application, each client can implement a specified interface. Do we have a counterpart of such interfaces in the stochastic domain? I don't know. I mean, I'm just going to ask questions now. Okay. And the other shortcoming could be that perhaps, uh, you know, in machine learning, even now, in spite of all this talk of model reuse, for each learning task, we create a separate model. And that is very unlike how our brain works. I mean, our accumulation of knowledge is aggregative, like we just keep on adding more and more information into this one brain. Whereas for machine learning, each data set is an independent task where we train an independent model and there is not much of sharing across models. So if we could create an elaborate structure of learning where we sort of have interconnects and maybe there are nodes which are named and uh, you know, and then we could perhaps handle, you know, these adversarial situations better because we would have more global intelligence, you know. So some people in machine learning might be thinking of multitask learning at this point, but multitask learning is still very shallow because you try to have training objectives for each of your tasks at just at the top layer, whereas what I'm talking about is really like a graph of reuse patterns and interdependency between different learning tasks. And I see no shame in involving humans in creating these structures and we should uh, sort of think of, you know, you know, how we can involve humans in creating models which generalize and better, which are less brittle, which can handle, you know, the unknowns much better. Okay. Uh, and that re might in fact require us to do lifelong learning. I know Partha's uh, group and all, they have worked on lifelong learning, but I think we are not done yet and that problem still continues to be of relevance. Another hot area and uh, another uh, another topic on which many machine learning researchers are betting, which will solve many of these problems, is to uh, to create models which are more causal. Uh, 
okay so modern uh, machine learning uh, kind of uh, has this attitude that the end justifies the means as as long as i am able to get high accuracy i don't care about how i get to that uh, accuracy so we latch too much on correlation and some of those correlations might just be incidental particularly when you have billions of parameters and perhaps uh, we need to think about the means to and means uh, become important when the going is hard thanks thank you professor for this very thought provoking talk so we are uh, almost out of time but uh, if any of you have a couple of questions uh, we can uh, take them Hi. Oh, you're allowed only one. <laughs> because this is a general talk, I will just ask uh, one very general question. So uh, you were saying that uh, these big companies might build general models which other people will download and maybe they have to fine tune. Uh, but I think that um, may be questioned because the way things are going, uh, I think everything is going to be owned by just a few companies. And even the customization or domain adoption will be done by the same companies and they will provide this as a service. So actually you don't really have to do anything because you just tell them this is, you please customize this for, for my application. Just like search ends up being you know, customized for enterprise, specific enterprises. Uh, similarly, I think some of these big companies will start providing very specific uh, solutions. Yeah, but uh, we know that even search, enterprise search is something with the fat tail of clients cannot afford. Right? So customization might be a solution for some of the richer clients, but there is a long fat tail of not so endowed clients where they might not want to pay one of these services for customizing to their data. Yeah, but you need to, at least if you have billions of parameters, then you have to store the customized parameters. But maybe if you actually do proper modularization so that the client specific parameters are smaller, then you may not have to worry about these issues. And in fact, these are some of the areas in which I am also working. We are thinking about what, you know, can we think of new ways in which servers can help clients adapt, adapt without putting any load on the server. So you do not, you know, can you provide APIs? So that's for, that was the point there. Can the server provide some layers, some adaptation layers, which will help you? Yeah, but that's a good question. Yeah. We have time for one last question. Uh, uh, good afternoon, ma'am. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, firstly, uh, you spoke about OOD. Uh, can the uh, network itself learn what is out of distribution? So that's one question. And uh, the other question was, uh, if some uh, prospective graduate students are thinking about the path to AGI, uh, is uh, path to uh, artificial general intelligence? Ah, okay. Uh, will the last slide that you mentioned be uh, potential methods towards that? The last couple of slides. <laughs> yeah, that's a big question. Uh, yeah. I mean, the first question is very easy to answer. Second question is very what last question. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, what was the OOD question? Ah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So, actually, yes. You know, if you, of course, you can put it as part of the same network, but it has to be like a watchdog. It has to be kind of sitting on top of the existing net network, and you can draw the boundary anywhere you want. Right, so I'm um, sorry we are out of time uh, because professor has to catch a flight. Actually, no, it's okay, I can. No, we, we need to, uh, <laughs> there you had it, I'm saying to, you know, she was speaking for an hour. But okay, so we can get a couple more questions. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yes. Actually 
actually you know that's what i'm asking in the last slide if you could come up with a mathematical definition then i think you would also solve the problem of clean adaptation i think that's where we are lacking we don't have a mathematical specification of what it means to get the best of theta and l very good question Possibility theory, possible. <laughs> yes. 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 What you had said earlier was that those noise vectors were actually carefully crafted, although they looked like white noise. Yeah. So you would suddenly miss out on all this carefully crafted stuff by using the random yeah. data. But see, that's why you go, go look for the worst such delta. We are not adding random vectors. We are just saying that the norm of the delta is bounded so that humans cannot tell the difference. Okay, I think uh, so. Okay, one last question, and that's after that we can uh, go for yeah. the feedback. Yeah, Finally, we used it for some supervised task. So we used it for a question dedupe task. So then we had. Hmm? No, we just were trying to detect whether two questions are duplicates or not. Like uh, in um, Quora and Stack Exchange forum, you have for like physics Quora and uh, you know uh, Unix Quora, and then you want to detect whether two questions are the same, and then we would be comparing them on their word embeddings and having some earth mover distance to kind of align the two sentences. So uh, now uh, I will request Professor Vasant to actually uh, give us a small gift to Professor Thanks. 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 Thanks.